Well, good morning. Always good to see everybody out this morning. And very sad to see my, my own parents not in the audience with us today as they were last week. It was uh, just a, a great blessing and great time for them to come out and visit for. They were here uh, almost two full weeks. And so it was good to see them in the audience last week. But uh, pray for them as they're, they're traveling uh, today, heading back home for West Virginia. And, and before we get into the lesson, I just want to make one comment because I, I saw this comment made, I don't know, about a week ago, and I just thought of it, well, there were just a few seconds ago. Uh, and, and it went something like this. I don't remember word for word, but it was something along the lines of, I'd rather sit in a church uh, with a hundred crying babies than sit in a church filled with silence. And I was reminded of that because we have so many young ones in our audience, and I think that that is such a great thing. Uh, Children are, are such a blessing, and it's a blessing that not everyone uh, is given an equal distribution. For, so for those of us who, who do have the blessing of, of children, it is they are a precious gift, but also a precious responsibility for us to show them the type of love God has for us, but to also raise them with the type of instruction and discipline that God has for us. But for our lesson today... Uh, as I've mentioned before, we're, we're kind of doing like a very loosely connected uh, series on like big picture themes of the Bible. Well, we're at a point now where it's not going to be so loosely structured anymore. Uh, we're going to be doing a, a series here on better Bible reading. And so if you remember, we started this series kind of with the six big things, six facts God wants you to know. And then we talked about God's grace. And then last week... Happy Easter, everybody. We talked about the resurrection. And when we considered the resurrection, we considered two main points through that lesson. And number one is the historical truth of the resurrection. And then the second point was a challenge for us to live in light of the resurrection. The resurrection is a challenge for us to live more like Jesus for us to consider how we need to be more like God and for us to not think of ways to make God more like us. And it was that final point that I'm going to launch off on today because it's one of the biggest problems that we have in our world today. Not just among unbelievers, but also even among believers. Even among those who would claim to be Christian, we see that for those that are unbelievers... What is their tenet that they live by? Well, they live by subjective morality. That, well, I do whatever I think is right. I don't believe in a God. I don't believe in a higher power. So no one can tell me what to do. I'm going to live however I want. I'm going to love whoever I want. If you remember our 17-week series on love from a while back, we talked about what that word truly means from a scriptural standpoint. But then even among believers who would claim to be faithful to God, we see so many within, loosely speaking, Christendom today that like to bend God's rules, that don't respect Jesus' authority, that don't recognize God's justice, don't acknowledge His judgment, and ignore every teaching on hell that Scripture has for us. There are so many that seek to excuse all sins, and they'll say that we can live however we want to and we can worship however we want to because God's grace gives us liberty to do whatever we want. Yeah, go back a couple weeks and we talked about grace and what that actually means. In regard to this, both the atheist and the progressive Christian are very much alike in that they will claim that we can live however we want to please ourselves. Because if it makes me happy, then obviously it, it makes God happy, is the reasoning. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to serve God the way that I want. One source for this problem, personal opinion, definitely not the only source, but I think one source for this is biblical ignorance. People just don't know enough about the Bible. Not only what's in it, but the history of how it came to be. How many of you all have heard of Penn Gillette? A number of you have. He's a famous magician from years back. I don't, I don't know what he's doing now, but uh, he was, it was the Penn and Teller show. Traveling magicians, they're really big. This is before YouTube, so that's probably why they're not as famous today, because their time was before the time of the interwebs. 
But Penn Jillette, he made this statement one time on a, on a national show, and he said, reading the Bible is the fast track to atheism. And he would point to passages in the Old Testament that show God's judgment, such as the destruction of the Canaanites. And he would make statements like, well, how could, how could a good God do this? That uh, podcast that I listen to uh, quite frequently, uh, there's uh, two gentlemen scholars that were discussing the same thing, uh, even among college students. And they said one of the one of the submissions they had, somebody wrote into their show, was a, a college student who said that he left his faith once he started reading the Bible because there was just so many things that left him feeling distraught. And he said, for example. I got to the ten plagues in Egypt. And I got to the final plague, death of the firstborn. And I was born and raised in a Christian home, but I had never read this passage before. I was born and raised in a Christian home, and so I was raised to think that Herod was the bad guy for killing the babies in Bethlehem, and yet God is the good guy for killing the babies in Egypt. I could not reconcile this, and so I gave up my faith. Well, this lesson isn't about the ten plagues, but just to let everyone know, God gave the Egyptians years to get right. He also gave them nine plagues previous to that one as warnings. Hey, fix yourselves. Let my people go. It's only going to get worse if you continue living in disobedience. God was not acting capriciously. He was not acting without giving plenty of due warning. He was acting with a sense of justice, and he gave plenty of opportunity for the Egyptians to respond and receive God's grace, and they denied it. So there's the answer for that one. But then I think about even in the denominational world today, I, I see so many advertisements. You know, Luckily here where we live in central Iowa, I don't see it quite as often, but even down the road you see different church billboards or online and you have these different advertisements pop up for different community churches that are out there. And I saw one a few days ago that was advertising a special seminar that this church was doing. It was, it was a church out in South Carolina that they were having a drag queen seminar in the church in which a, a transgendered individual would be worshiping and leading the worship service and celebrating the inclusivity of God's love. Again, go back to the 17-week sermon that we did before on understanding God's love, and there's no room for disobedience in God's love. But then I'll give you just one more example. Uh, so my, my cousin, I've got a cousin who uh, is a Bible class teacher in West Virginia. He, he takes the middle school age students. Uh, he's got about 7 to 10 kids in his class. So they're all around you know, that middle school age, you know, 12, 13, maybe 14. And he told me uh, that in this class, he didn't have a single student. Now, these, he's, this isn't, he's not in a prison setting. He, he's in a church. Almost all of the kids that are in his class have grown up in the church. And they, he didn't have a single student who knew what the Gospels are. What does that tell us about the role of parents in our children's spiritual education. That bringing them to church for one, maybe two hours when I'm speaking, on Sundays, isn't enough. It needs to be a daily practice. It needs to be a daily encouragement for our children and for ourselves. And so I wanted to do this series as an encouragement for all of us to be better Bible readers. So that when we approach the Bible and when we read it for ourselves and when we are doing our own daily studies, we will have some ground rules on how to read the Bible and understand it, uh, at least at a base level, so that we're not completely thrown off guard when we read of God killing the Egyptians or God ordering the Israelites to kill the Canaanites. When we read of crazy rules like not boiling a goat in its mother's milk and we say, well, what kind of crazy God would make this a rule? Well, there are certain principles for Bible study that once we get these down, all passages in the Bible will make a little bit more sense. That doesn't mean we're going to have perfect understanding. It doesn't mean we're going to have perfect knowledge. 
but it means we'll have some foundational principles that will help us not be completely thrown off our rocker and, and just completely like, I have no idea what God's doing here. He he's must be completely out of control. And this was actually a series that I did with uh, my National Guard unit a while back. And if memory serves me correctly, I might have actually done this exact first sermon with you guys once before, probably a year and a half, two years ago. But I was thinking if I'd already forgotten some of the main points, maybe you guys had too. Hopefully you guys had a better memory than me, but if not, we're just going to continue anyway. And so uh, this, this series, it's at least four parts. When I did it with the guard, I did it in four parts. But there's some room for me to maybe expand this, uh, maybe add a little bit more material uh, for our learning purposes. Because when I gave it in the guard, it was, it was very rushed because I'm always pressed for time. Uh, but part one is going to be talking about, broad picture, the unique nature of the Christian faith. And then part two, we're going to talk about the structure and the contents of the Bible. And then part three, it's going to be, okay, how do I read and interpret my Bible? And then part four is, okay, so I know the general structure and layout, and I know some basic interpretation principles, but now how do I take those principles uh, and then take Scripture and actually apply it in my life? Because there's a big difference between knowing how to interpret Scripture and then being motivated to apply it in my daily life. So that's going to be part four. Could be part seven or eight by the time we get to it, depending on how much I build this out. But for today's lesson, our two main goals are this. I'm hoping that we leave here today with, one, feeling challenged to, to reconsider how we think about the word religion and how we think about the Bible itself. And, and then the second goal is to challenge us to identify biblical values in all aspects of our life. So that when we leave here on Sundays or on Wednesday evenings, and we go to our homes or we go to school or we go to our jobs or wherever we go, we will be challenged to be more attuned to biblical principles even when Scripture isn't right in front of us. And so I want to start us off with a little game here. Uh, how many of y'all have been to an eye doctor before? And you do that. Like, which one's better, one or two? All right? We're going to play that game. Okay? And so I'm going to ask this question. Which of these aircraft has traveled more miles? So here's one. Here's two. One. Two. There we go. We've got some good arguments on both sides. One or two? Well, we say one because it's a real aircraft, but we say two because in the Star Wars mythos, the Falcon has a lot of miles under its belt. And while it's fun to think about such things, the challenge that we are left here with is to think about what's the difference between fiction and reality. So the answer is it's one. Because only the Black Hawk We've got these right, right up at the Boone National Guard right there at the airport. You can see all the Black Hawks they have out in the hangar. They're pretty cool. The Black Hawk has traveled real miles. The Black Hawk has transported real people. The Black Hawk has a tangible effect in our world. Whereas the Millennium Falcon, it's fiction. It's not real. It's, it's fun to think about. It's kind of neat to think about, you know, traveling however many parsecs and something quantum leaps or whatever. I'm not a big Star Wars guy, so I can't really quote it, but it's kind of fun to think about. And maybe, maybe watching things like Star Wars, and you guys know that I'm a big Spider-Man fan, you know, we can feel a certain level of motivation even when we, when we hear these stories and the good guy wins. But we need to be mindful that they're not real. They don't have a real... The Millennium Falcon hasn't actually transported a real soldier from a battlefield and taken them to a hospital. A Millennium Falcon has never sent supplies to people on a battlefield to save them. It's never made a real tangible difference. We have to be able to disconnect fiction from reality. And it's something that is becoming an increasing problem in our world. Because everywhere you look, not only do we have... Heads buried in phones, but now they've got the VR goggles, and now they've got Facebook is going to the quote-unquote metaverse, where they just want you to live in this virtual reality. We need to remember 
None of that is real. You, me, our neighbors, those are real people. Infinitely more valuable than any fiction story. If we can't make that difference, we won't be able to talk about the Christian faith with anyone. We have to be able to distinguish between what's real and what's fake. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Religion, reality, and we're going to close with some good advice. Everyone's favorite dictionary, Merriam-Webster, defines religion as this. The service and worship of God, or the supernatural, and then secondly, a commitment or devotion to religious faith or observance. Now, does Christianity fit this definition? Yes. Yes, it does. Christianity is a religion. I'm not going to shy away from that. I, I can't tell you how, much, how big of a pet peeve it is when people say, well, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. That drives me bonkers. It's not an either or. Yes, we need to have a good relationship with God. But if we don't remember that our relationship with God is based on a religious devotion to Him, remembering that He is above us, we have then equated ourselves with God and turned ourselves into idols. We need to have a relationship with God our Father. But we need not forget our role in that relationship. And that is to serve and worship Him. Now, based on this definition alone, what else is considered a religion? Star Wars could be. Believing in the Force could be considered a religion. If, if a person is so devoted to the supernatural essence of the Force... And committing yourself to all of the Star Wars library and, and all of the fictional books of Star Wars and you're devoted to that and, and you, you really love this concept of the Jedi way and living, living separate from society and a life of solitude and defending truth, maybe that appeals to you. But if your devotion is to Star Wars, well, that's a religion, but is that religion based on anything that's real. We look at reality. Aaron Webster, thank you again. A real event, entity or state of affairs. The totality of real things. And this is what sets Christianity apart from Star Wars. This is what sets Christianity apart from nearly all other world religions is that Christianity is based in historical reality. We can think of the Millennium Falcon, transporting Han Solo, but that didn't happen. But you know what did happen? God came to earth in human form in the shape and form of His Son, Jesus. That's real. That's the Black Hawk that has saved real soldiers' lives. Jesus is the real Savior who has saved our very real sins. But most importantly, we think of the reality, as we discussed last week, of this event. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. If it's not true, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, he didn't come out of that tomb, then everything that we're doing here is a waste of time because it's not based in reality. It would be based on a work of fiction. That's why the resurrection is so integral. We have a tremendous amount of good evidence to believe in the resurrection. We briefly talked about that last week. If it's not true, then this Bible is worth as much as a Spider-Man comic. You know, about $2 on the newsstand. Well, inflation is probably up to like $5 now. That's all it's worth. But if it's true, if it's accurate, Jesus really died on the cross, resurrected, then this is worth the infinite value of our souls. 
And we need to be encouraged by that and to live by that. I want us to think about one of my other favorite chapters in the Bible. Acts 17. Paul is in Athens. You heard of the Greek gods? And this is something that's taught in schools. Why is it that we can teach Zeus in schools, but we can't teach Jesus? You ever thought about that? It's kind of odd to me. Paul is in Athens, home of the Greek gods. He's pointing to all these idols that they worship, all these false gods. And what I think is interesting is that Paul actually starts off with a compliment. And he says, good for you guys. Because you recognize there's more to this life than just the physical. That there is a spiritual reality. But let me tell you about the God you don't know. You worship all these gods that can control the weather or, or wine or all these physical entities. But let me tell you about the God above them. The one who created everything. I want to tell you about that God. And I have these two verses pulled up here on the slide. Paul gives us the purpose of his ministry and the purpose of Jesus. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. He has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now what's really important about this sermon, well, one of many things that's really important, is that this happened within a generation of Christ's death on the cross. Paul is saying, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the one true God who can't be served with human hands, who is the creator of everything else that you worship. He's above that. Let me tell you, he died on the cross for your sins because he doesn't want you to face the final judgment. And if you don't believe me, go down to Jerusalem and check it out. Let me tell you where his tomb is. Find out for yourselves if the body's missing. That's one of the most powerful things when we consider sermons from the first century, is that everyone who hears the gospel message then could travel right to Jerusalem and start asking around, Hey, have you guys seen Jesus anywhere? Where'd he go? They could test it in real time. And now we know that some responded to Paul in this way and believed, but many denied him. But the importance here is that Paul is saying, hey, prove me wrong on this. Because if you find Jesus' body, then I'll stop preaching. But if you can't, then his words that we need to seek God, that's our purpose in life. His words that we need to prepare for a final judgment, that's our purpose in life. Now, you might not like everything that Jesus has to say, but it doesn't matter if you like it or not. What matters is if you obey, regardless of whether you like it. You know, growing up, I used to want to fly. And I don't mean in an airplane. I mean, literally, I wanted to, like, just Superman it and just, I mean, I, I dreamed about it. I had, it was one of very few recurring dreams I've ever had in my entire life. Countless times in my childhood, I would have these extremely, like, vivid, you ever have those dreams that it just, it feels real, and when you wake up, like, it takes you a few minutes to orient yourself because you think that, like, was that a dream? Was, did that really happen? I would have these vivid dreams that I could just take off and fly. And so, in elementary school, our playground had this, uh, like, teepee-looking thing. It was like an a, it was like an A-frame on a roof, uh, and it was, like, laddered on either side. And when I'm five, six years old, you know, this thing looked like a skyscraper, but it was probably only five or six feet tall. But when I was on the playground, what I, what I thought I could do was I would, I would climb up on that first step. You know, I'm only like a foot off the ground. And I would jump. And, and then day by day, week by week, I'd get a little bit braver. Edwin's already doing this. He just, you know, our bed's like three, four feet off the ground. He's already jumping off. He thinks he can fly. I need to fix him on that one. Sorry, Edwin. But I would work my way up because I thought if I, if I just had enough faith... If I could just climb to that next rung to show how much faith I had that I could fly, then maybe I'll be able to take off. <laughs> it's by the grace of God I didn't break my neck and kill myself because you know when you're five six years old, it, six feet is pretty tall. I mean that's a, you know almost twice your height. 
And I'm jumping off of this thinking, I'm going to fly. I'm going to do it this time. Unfortunately, there's this thing called gravity. It doesn't matter how much I don't like gravity. I am going to obey it. I don't have a choice in the matter. Every time I jump off of something, gravity is going to work. It doesn't matter how much we like or dislike the words of God. We need to obey it. Because just like gravity, one judgment day, God's word is going to take a hold of our souls and it's going to pull us one of two directions. And we need to be mindful in obeying it. So that brings us to asking the question, so then, why is Scripture written? And in John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus is speaking and He says that you search the Scriptures, and He's talking to religious leaders. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. What is the purpose of the Bible? What is the purpose of Scripture? So that we would have eternal life. That is why God has given us His Word. And His Word points to Jesus. Now, I've, I've heard it said before, every book of the Bible points to Jesus. Not every verse, but every book. Because every book in the Old Testament, in some form, some much more explicitly than others, is an indication pointing the love that God has for us in the form of His Son, Jesus. And the New Testament is the account of Jesus' ministry. God's Word is our key to eternal life, and it's only through recognition of Jesus that we have access to that life. So when we think about God's Word as the key to eternal life, Everyone gets so caught up about the search for the, the fountain of youth. You know, we read of all these accounts of, of the globe travelers from the, from the 14, 15, 1600s, and they're all searching the fountain of youth. Well, guys, we've got it. It's right here. This is, this, is, this is the tree of life now. Okay, This is the fountain of youth now. And it's through Jesus. And when we know that that's what God has given us, it leaves us thinking about this. Four questions in life that the Bible has answers to, but that every person should be seeking. Question one, where do we come from? Question two, how did we get here at this point in time? Question three, where are we going? And question four, how do we get there? Question one, where do we come from? Well, even science tells us that before there was everything, there was nothing. And it is an undeniable fact that no one disagrees with among the scientific community that nothing turned into everything. So now the question is, how did that happen? Well, it was a supernatural event. It was a miraculous event. And we believe that there's plenty of evidence to say that only God could do that. There is no law in nature that says things just poof into existence. By every observation that we have, a creation requires a creator. The Bible gives us the answer on where we come from. Not only that, but how does the laws of nature, which say all things tend towards entropy, all things towards to death, all things work towards chaos... If that's the laws of nature, then how is there so much order that allows us to have life on this planet? It would take a supernatural ordering of the universe for there to even be a possibility of life. But more than that, not only how does something come from nothing, but how does an immaterial something, how does, how does a rock, how does dust become alive? That would take a supernatural event, something outside the laws of nature. And we as Christians are unafraid to say, that something outside of nature is God. He's the only answer for life and for creation. So how did we get here when we look around us today? Well, we, we, we see all the good things in this life, but we also see all the bad things in this life. One of the most common 
criticisms and skepticisms of the Christian faith is, yeah, but how could a good God allow so many heartaches and heartbreaks in the world? Well, good news is, this book that God gives us tells us. And yeah, we started off, we had heaven on earth in the garden, and then who messed it up? Did God mess it up? No. Man messed it up. We did. We already had heaven on earth. We already had our paradise. And we said, you know what, God, this is pretty good, but it's not good enough for me. I want something more than what you've given me. I want to break the one and only law that you've given me because I think I know better than you, God. So what is the punishment for that? God casts man out of paradise. God orders the world in such a way that now we have to work for our understanding. We have to work to make things better. It's not a given paradise like it was initially that we would have to strive to come to know him through reason and through understanding. That's why we have so many problems in the world today because people have used that free will to reason and to understand goodness. They said, ah, God gave me this gift to do whatever I want, so I'm going to hurt my neighbor. Instead of love my neighbor as myself, I'm going to conquer my neighbor and rule them. We have so many problems in this world because people have disobeyed God. And the Bible does nothing but confirm that. Now where are we going? Now it's interesting that science will tell us that we are going through this life towards heat death. There's going to come a day when, well, if you believe in climate change the way some people do, well, we're all going to burn up and die in the next 10 years because we're just ruining the atmosphere and we're all going to burn up. But even if you don't believe we're going to burn up and die in the next 10 years, what do we know about the sun? What do we know about the stars? That stars, their very existence, works towards heat death. They go into a supernova, an explosive state, and they collapse on themselves because they burn out of substance that allows them well, to burn. Now what's interesting is that the Word of God, the key to eternal life, also gives us this warning. Peter writes in 2 Peter 3, 7, But by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Isn't it interesting that science will say we're going to die of heat death, but then you look at God's word and it says we're going to die of heat death? What an interesting confirmation that is. Whether you believe in the Bible or not, we're all going towards a heat death. The truth of the Bible tells us what that heat death will bring. And that's where the next question is, how do we get there? Do we want to live in that heat death through all eternity? Or do we want to return to paradise the way God intended us to? The Bible tells us how we can get to where we want to go. We want, to, we want paradise? God tells us how to get there. We want to live in an eternal state of heat death? Well, it tells us how we get there too. The important thing to remember is that these questions are questions that all mankind needs to answer. And the Bible gives an answer to all of them. Because Scripture gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, I have that highlighted for one specific reason. Because it doesn't say Scripture gives us all things that pertain to health and wealth. Just because we believe in the Bible doesn't mean that God is going to give us perfect health and make us as rich as Elon Musk. Nowhere does God promise us earthly riches. Only eternal ones. His eternal riches come from living by the life of love that he has for us today. So in this respect, we can think about the Bible as kind of an operator's manual. I know we've got at least one mechanic in the audience here. My unit, aviation unit, they have a lot of mechanics. And so when I gave this lesson with them, I said, all right, where are my mechanics at? Because i got a question for you. If we have a Black Hawk that's broken and you can't get it off the ground, are you going to come ask your chaplain how to fix it? Are you going to consult the, what's known as the TM, the technical manual? This is the operator's guide to a Black Hawk. This is the manual that has all the things that can go wrong with a Black Hawk and how to fix it. So are you going to consult that manual? Or are you going to consult me? They said, well, we're going to go to the manual. And why would you do that? Well, because the manual tells us how to get the Black Hawk to fly again. It tells us how to get the Black Hawk to do its purpose. It was designed to fly, and the manual tells us how to get it to fly. Well, what is our purpose in this life? To seek God. To love God. To love our neighbor. 
to prepare for judgment. We can think of this as our operator's manual for life. This book tells us how to fulfill our purpose. How often do we consult it, though? Our bodies are made by God. There is no one better than God that would know how to use our bodies. He is our creator. He is the one who wrote the manual on how to live life. Which brings us to our final section, in which I'm going to cover. These will go fast. I know the, ten, the number 10 might seem scary, but these will go fast. 10 rules for life. Now, this does not mean, once again, that the Bible teaches a health and wealth. Please don't misunderstand that I'm trying to teach a prosperity gospel. I'm only offering this, that if the Bible truly is the key to eternal life, if the Bible truly is the key to living out our purpose in this life, then what I'm going to state is that all things that are objectively good in this life will have confirmation in the Bible. And all things that are in the Bible, when properly studied in their context, are objectively good. That principle will be in the next few lessons. How to read things in their proper context. Because it's too easy to just turn to your favorite verse and rip it out of context. It's too easy for a critic to turn to the passage of God killing the Egyptian babies and saying, look how terrible God is, and lifts it out of context. All things in their proper context, when rightly understood, everything the Bible teaches is objectively good. So what does that mean? Well, if we recognize some good principles in life, we should expect to find some form of confirmation of those good things. And so I wanted to share these 10 rules for life that were offered up by Steve Simmons, who is a professional motivational speaker. He, tra he has traveled to every single state in the United States. He's traveled all over the world. Literally, his job is to go to businesses and train like their CEOs and whatnot on how to be more powerful and more effective leaders. And he says, hey, these are 10 life principles that if you follow these, you will become a more effective leader. And what I thought was interesting when I listened to his seminar, all 10 of these have direct ties to principles in Scripture. And isn't it amazing that these time-tested principles for leadership, if you read your Bible, you'd already know them. So I wanted to share them with you. So lesson one, don't die until you're dead. This is my favorite one on the list. Do not give up on life while you still have a life to live. Now what does Paul tell us about this same principle? For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor. I love this passage because Paul says, Hey, if I die, I'm going to heaven anyway. But you know what? While God has still put breath in my lungs, that means he has still put purpose in my life, and that's to serve him. Christians, we're not supposed to die until we're dead. And only God chooses that time. But until God has appointed our time to die, we better be living for him. Number two, go where there is no path and leave a trail. Be a trailblazer. Don't be afraid to do what's different. Don't be afraid to take the path less traveled. Oh boy, talk about Jesus being a trailblazer. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his footsteps. Whose footsteps are we to follow in? Hercules' footsteps? No. Peter's footsteps, Paul's footsteps, no. Luther's footsteps, John Calvin's footsteps, no. Jesus' footsteps. He's the only one who walked with the cross. He's the only one who died for our sins. He's the only one who teaches us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow him daily. Talk about being a trailblazer. If you want to do something that the rest of the world isn't doing, Live selflessly. Live to seek the goodwill for others. Number three, when you're through changing, you're through. Don't be stagnant. Take care that you are not carried away with error of lawless people, but grow in grace and knowledge. This is an excellent reminder of two things. One, we are not expected to have perfect knowledge. God does not expect us to know everything there is to know. That's good news. But here's the other side. 
He expects us to grow. Growth is a spiritual command. We need to not be ever to a point where we think, well, I'm done changing in my Christian walk. I'm worried. I'm exactly where I need to be and there's no reason for me to do any more. There's no reason for me to ever challenge my faith. We are expected to grow in our understanding of God's grace, to grow in our knowledge of what He has done for us and how we take that, apply it in our lives, and teach it to others. Number four, if opportunity doesn't knock, build a door. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The New Testament is full of calls to action. I think I've said it before, but if you want a fun challenge, read through the New Testament and highlight every single command that's given. The Christian faith is a call to action. It's a command to do. Nowhere is there an example or a teaching that after becoming a Christian, we're to sit on our hands and wait for God to serve us, but for us to get up and start serving Him. We are called to seek after God. We're called to be knocking on that door. God, I'm trying. God, get, open that next door for me to do more for you. Number five. Always be negative free. Always. What a, what a challenge that is. That's hard to live by. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God. Well, I fail in this one a lot. The only point that I'll make that I think is interesting when we consider this, and in the context we're thinking about today, most of us have probably heard some really good motivational speeches outside of the pulpit before. We, we've probably had that one football coach that could just, man, he could really fire us up. We heard that one guest speaker who just, you know, he really helped me turn my life around. Maybe we looked up a YouTube video and, and, and heard some, some really good advice about always being thankful. And, and what I find it, that's interesting, I, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one who's thought this way. But when I hear somebody like a Steve Simmons, a motivational speaker, and he says, always be thankful. Yeah, Steve, you got it, man. We need to always be thankful. What a great message. But then when I read the same message in God's Word, too often I'm tempted to think, yeah, but God, don't you know how hard it is? God, you know what I'm going through. How can I be thankful in this? I think we need to be challenged that when a motivational speaker tells us to be thankful and we feel encouraged by it, we should challenge our faith to feel just as encouraged by God in that. Number six, focus only on what you can control. A man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. You see, without having self-control and discipline, we are defenseless against the enemy of sin. We need to learn self-control in our lives. Number seven, check your attitudes Daily. This is going to be very connected to the passage of always giving thanks. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, that it may give grace to those who hear. This is another challenge for us. When we consider our interactions with others, do they walk away feeling built up by what we said to them? We need to have hearts that seek ways to do this. But we also need to have hearts that recognize when we need to be the one that needs built up. Hey, brother, hey, sister, I'm, I'm feeling pretty down. Can you pray with me? Can you sit with me? Right now, I'm the one that needs built up. And we have to be cognizant of when we can help build others, but when we ourselves need to take time and allow others to help build up us as well. Don't lose your perspective. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Focus on the positive in life. There are a whole lot of bad things in this life, but I promise you, there's only as many bad things as there are that you spend time thinking about them. Because the longer you think about everything that's wrong in this world, the more that you're going to think is wrong with this world. But when we focus on 
truth, when we focus on justice, when we th focus on love and purity, we'll not only start seeing that more, but we'll start living by it more as well because it's what our hearts and our minds are set on. Don't let the world consume you. Number nine, live with excellence, enthusiasm, and passion. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. This body, it ain't getting any younger. Some of us in the audience, that's more true than others. But the good news is, our spirits are renewed every day that we feed them. Our spirits can be eternally youthful and young. That is a promise from God. When we focus on the good things, when we nurture our souls, that is how we stay spiritually youthful. Our bodies will let us down, but we can trust in our spirits to always keep us moving towards God's will. Number 10, whatever you are, be a good one. This is my second favorite on the list. And just like all the others, I fail at it way too often. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. You know, it's easy to work really hard for a boss that you like. How much harder is it to work for a boss that you don't like? Now, I've, I've been in some circumstances before where I had a, a superior, a boss, if you will, that I really did not like. But this passage reminds me that I'm not, I'm not really working for him. I mean, maybe in the immediate temporary, yes, I'm, I'm doing his directives, but really, my actions, my behavior, they're a reflection of God more than they are a reflection of my employer. And I need to be working for God in whatever I do, in whatever you do. Because when others see us working diligently, it reveals to them the type of character that God calls Christians to have. And it sets a good example for others. That no matter, no matter how, how much you don't like life or things about your life or your boss, that it's not going to stop you from giving your best. Because you work for God, who is greater than any boss, who is greater than any trial or struggle or stress in your life. And that is what motivates you and encourages you to continually give your best because you want to bring Him honor and glory. And so, to wrap us up, we're doing this study on what am I supposed to do with my Bible? Another way I could phrase this is we're going to be doing a study on better Bible reading. And so today I wanted us to just think differently about the word religion. I wanted us to think differently about the Bible and our faith. Do we live it as if it is true? Because we know that it's true, but do we actually live in honor of that? Do we look for biblical principles? Because there are so many good things in this life. I'll share this story. Uh, my sister, who I've said many times, she doesn't mind me sharing because she's very vocal about it. She's not a, she's not a Christian. She doesn't believe. But she is so excited about this new job, job opportunity that she started about two weeks ago. Uh, she is working for a nonprofit organization in West Virginia, which she is, is getting paid to go out and help homeless people in the community. And she, she goes out and she, she takes them to the hospital. She, she takes them to the shelter. She takes them to wherever they need to get food. And she loves her job because she loves serving other people. She's got the right heart. And she texted me two days ago. And she was at a homeless shelter, and she was helping prepare food. And this was a homeless shelter that was sponsored by a church. And so everyone else there, aside from my sister, is, is claiming to believe in the Bible, is, would say that they are a Christian, and I, I don't know them personally. I don't, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not judging here. I'm just telling you what she shared with me. And she said that, that everybody, you know, there's so much unity. Everybody's great. It's great fellowship. They're getting the food ready. And then when they, when they open the doors to, to, for the homeless people to come in and start getting food, what did all those Christians do? Well, they, they went and hid in the back because they didn't want to be associated with the people they were helping. What type of principle does that teach the world when that's how we act? 
We need to be better than that. I don't know those people. Just sharing what Ashley shared with me. But that is why we need to take the good things in this life and connect them to God's Word. Why is it good to help homeless people? Because God has given us a heart to love others. That is the source of objective morality. You don't have to believe in God to do good, but without God there is no such thing as good. The more that we are in tune with recognizing these biblical principles in our everyday life, the more we will be equipped to begin connecting the world with Scripture, to encourage others to consider these things, that they might turn to Jesus as well. So what about you guys? What about us today? We always close with an invitation. This isn't your typical Sunday sermon, I know it, but perhaps we've covered something that has made you think differently about your faith. That has encouraged you to recognize some struggles in your life, some sins in your life. That's like, you know what? I need the help of the church. We don't want to leave here until you get the help that you need. No matter what you're struggling through. That's all part of what God's family, Christ's family, His church is about. Building one another up. So if you have any needs here this morning, don't waste the opportunity that we have here while we're gathered together. And let us know as together we stand and sing.